morning, church. Welcome to our Good Friday service. It's our hope this morning that um, through the service, we will really feel the weight of everything about Good Friday so that on Sunday, we can experience and feel all the joy in celebrating our risen Savior. So I invite you to stand and sing into that weight and heaviness of Good Friday this morning.
for the presence in this sanctuary or joining us by media. I'm glad that you could join us, but more importantly, our Heavenly Father is very pleased. Today is a special day that we call Good Friday. In this special service, we will also have the opportunity to participate in Holy Communion. So if you are connecting to the service, please have some grape juice and bread ready to serve at the appropriate time. Let's pray. Lord, as we gather here or connect via media, we ask for you to be present among us through your Holy Spirit so that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Truly, Lord, may we be blessed and encouraged in our faith as we remember what you did, Lord Jesus, for us on this day so many years ago. Bless our service with your presence, we pray in Jesus' name. Please receive this blessing. Grace to you from God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, our living, resurrected Savior, who lived, died, and conquered the grave, and in the fellowship of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue in singing, O Sacred Head, Not Wounded. Exodus chapter 6, 
and then moving to Mark chapter 14. But before I read those verses, I am just going to uh, come to God in prayer. God, as we move into a space of this morning where we hear from Pastor Rick, we ask that you will open our hearts our minds and our ears to the words that you have to bring us this morning through Pastor Rick. And we ask Holy Spirit that you would so evidently be in this place. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. From Exodus chapter 6, starting at verse 6. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with my outstretched arm and with my mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will take you. And now we're going to Mark chapter 14. They went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Ah. Dear people of God, this is a special day, Good Friday, on the Christian calendar. And I'm glad that we can join each other, whether physically here or in the sanctuary or by joining by media. In a little while, I hope to lead you in a celebration of Holy Supper or communion, the special supper that our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, established for us. Jesus established it on that Thursday evening of the day before Jesus went to the cross. He did this in advance because he wanted his disciples to understand, and therefore us, and be reassured. He knew they wouldn't get it at the time he did it, but later Jesus knew it would help them and us to comprehend, to really get what Jesus did for us on that first Good Friday. Holy Communion is a really important and physical object lesson, one that we eat and drink with physical actions to help us reflect on a very real and tangible life-restoring event for humanity on that first Good Friday. But before I lead you in this memorial supper, I would like us to reflect for a short time on the elements of the Holy Supper, and more specifically, the cup, represented here by a cup of grape juice, the fruit of the vine. It's a cup that is about God's will. I first became intrigued by the cup of the Holy Communion and its origin in the Jewish Passover through a message that was shared many years ago by a Jewish Christian missionary. Her name was Nick. Nicole, working for Jews for Jesus. She shared with us how Jesus repurposes the elements of the Passover into the Holy Communion meal. She helped us to understand how Jesus assigned new meaning to the three elements of the Passover. The lamb, the bread, and the fruit of the vine. She helped us understand the purpose of the four cups of the traditional Passover but specifically the third cup, the cup of redemption. I hope by sharing this morning, I will help you appreciate and understand more deeply the meaning of the cup 
that we drink as part of the Holy Supper as we celebrate it today. But I know this is a limited focus. Still, I invite you to discover more about the Passover meal elements and traditions. For now, I don't want us to get bogged down into too much detail, and I invite you to do so on your own. But I don't want you to lose sight of the real goal of the message this morning. The importance of Jesus fulfilling God's will by drinking the cup of God's wrath, the cup of redemption. As we study the scriptures, we understand that the key elements of the Holy Supper, as Jesus instituted, are the bread and the wine, or the juice from grapevines. In the time of our scripture reading, it would have been wine, as that was the only way to preserve grape juice. Note these elements of the Holy Communion have their origin in the Passover. In fact, the disciples thought that they were simply preparing for a traditional Passover meal. That's what they were expecting when we read Mark's account. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he said to his disciples, he sent two of his disciples, okay, telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you, follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready, make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. There, so they prepared the Passover. This is how Holy Communion started out. But it would turn out to be a Passover like none other. And actually, it would be the final Passover. Jesus was instituting its replacement. In the communion meal that Jesus puts into place, he takes the elements of the Passover, the lamb, the bread, and the wine, and applies them to them a fuller and significantly new meaning. In all of the Passover before, the sacrificial lamb, the bread, and the fruit of the vine all point to God's rescue plan for his people, and ultimately to the final rescue plan in Jesus. Jesus, the Lamb of God, crucified on a cross and his blood shed. Jesus takes that last Passover with his disciples and establishes a new memorial meal and makes a new covenant which he puts into place that evening before he finishes the work of redemption on the cross to drink the cup of God's wrath. In the traditional Passover, there is the meal of the sacrificed animal, a lamb. There is unleavened bread eaten with oil and wine, and there are at least four cups of wine that are set out. Some traditions actually have a fifth cup that is not drink, drunk. It's left on the table. It's called the Elijah cup. Look that up on the internet if you like. The wine is served at different points in the Passover ceremony. The four cups are taken as the meal progresses with the unfolding story of the Passover, that first Passover in Egypt. It follows the progressions of God's promises for his people as laid out in Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7, which just Nikki just read for us, which are called the four I wills, promises that God makes to his people. Verse 6. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and, cup one, I will bring you out from under the yoke, the authority of the Egyptians. Cup number two, I will free you, or rescue you, 
from being slaves to them. Cup number three. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. Cup number four. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. In that first Passover, the lamb that was slain and some of, it was blood, of, of, some of its blood was smeared on the doorpost of the house protecting the people inside from the angel of death. The angel of death who would be passing over the homes of those that had the blood. People who ate and observed the special meal were spared the life of their firstborn in their home. They were passed over from the sentence of death. In a similar way, in the Holy Supper, Jesus now takes the bread that he breaks and said that it is his body which is given for our salvation. And he takes the cup and declares that it now represents a new covenant in his blood, not a lamb's blood, but his own blood that is poured out so that we, may, we who believe are redeemed from death. And that way, we are passed over from death to life. If we look at the two first I wills in our Exodus passage, represented by the first two cups of the Passover, I will bring you out and I will free you from the yoke of slavery. We can verify by reading further in our Bibles that God accomplishes that. The Israelites are freed from Pharaoh's rule and freed from slavery and brought up out of Egypt. Further, a few days later, God accomplishes the third will or cup as well. Picture Moses standing beside the Red Sea with his outstretched arms as the waters close over Pharaoh and his mighty men. A drowning judgment on them all. But with the meaning of that third cup of the Passover, the cup of redemption, we can also see the picture of Jesus with outstretched arms on the cross, bearing the judgment of sin on himself. As Jesus drinks the cup of God's wrath on sinful mankind and redeems us. When Jesus met in that upper room with his disciples for that last meal together, Jesus knew what it would take to accomplish that redemption. In the Holy Supper, Jesus now declares that the third cup is now the cup of a new covenant in his blood. A covenant is a solemn promise, a vow. And Jesus promises that we may be part of this new covenant by believing in him so that we are saved and spared from the penalty of sin, which is death. Take notice of the events as they are recorded in Matthew. When we, I'm just going to read from Matthew in this moment, but at this time, the first two cups have already been taken when they would have shared stories of the plagues that led to that fatal night when the angel of death passed over, as well as the stories of the mass exodus and being followed by Pharaoh and his army going through the Red Sea and how that great Pharaoh and his troops drowned in the Red Sea. Jesus takes the next cup, and the third cup. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of a new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in the Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And then it is over. The supper is over. They leave the table. There is no mention of drinking the fourth cup. The cup that refers to the fourth I will. When God says he promises to take us to be his people and that he will be our God. 
Note that Jesus also says in verse 29, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day that I, when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. It seems logical to understand that once we have been redeemed, our sins washed away, and then and only then can we truly be accepted. Only then can we drink that fourth cup with Jesus. They leave and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him to a place removed from the others, and then goes a little further to pray. And the disciples are used to that. Jesus often did that. He would take one of them so that he spent time with God the Father. Jesus knew what was to come. He knew what it would take to drink that cup of redemption, also known as the cup of wrath. And he knew what it would take to settle the sentence of death once and for all on the cross. Humanly speaking, Jesus was asking for a way out. Jesus is overwhelmed and in agony because of the task at hand on that first Good Friday. He prays and prays for God to take this cup of wrath away. Our text, Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, that not what I will, but what you will. Three times Jesus prays this prayer. Jesus knows his father can take it away. Surely the father can. Jesus knows that the father could step in like he did when he stopped Abraham from offering Isaac on the altar in anguish. And after three cycles of prayer, Jesus finally submits to the father's will. He knows the cup of redemption must be drunk. The Lamb of God must be offered. Jesus' body and blood offered in our place. And that leads us to Jesus' crucifixion and death on the cross. Right there in Exodus 6, verse 6. I find it difficult to say that something as cruel and torturous as death on the cross an instrument of cruel suffering, horrendous pain, and gasping for breath could be called wonderful. As in the hymn we sometimes sing, The Wonderful Cross. Darkness, sin unmasked, Jesus' rejection by the Father. The images conjured in my mind are just too awful. But what is accomplished is pivotal, is very good, is wonderful. Because of the outcome of the events on that first Friday, it is more than good for us who believe. More than wonderful for you and I do not need to drink that cup of wrath. Instead, we drink the cup of a new communion in Jesus' blood, a new covenant. This is now a pivotal part of Holy Communion, of our Holy Supper. Its key role is to assure all of us who believe that we are redeemed and that we will be accepted and eligible to drink that fourth cup one day with Jesus in glory because we are accepted by God. God's will to be our God as he promised to the people of Israel before they left Egypt. We are now chosen to be his people. Drinking that third cup, the cup of redemption was critical to save us and all creation. When man disobeyed God's will for the first time by eating fruit from the tree God told us not to, we as mankind have been struggling with obedience ever since, from generation to generation. We all have sinned and strayed from God. Jesus, as both human and divine, is fully obedient and drinks the cup of God's wrath, the sentence of death for us sinners. God's wrath is now satisfied through Jesus. God said then, 
And he says to us today, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment, and I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Through Jesus, we celebrate that today. We share in his whole, this holy supper as Jesus himself has given it to us. I invite all who genuinely believe in Jesus as their savior to come and join in this communal meal. The third cup is now the new covenant in Jesus' blood. It is now the part of the covenant meal that Jesus has made for us. Hallelujah, what a savior. So let's approach the table. We are also all socially distant from God, but no longer. So let us be of one heart and mind. Let our eyes and our thoughts focus on this table as we take up these special elements here and in our homes. Please have the bread and juice ready. As I look at you in the sacrament of Holy Community, Communion, I realize that I'm following the footsteps of thousands in the last almost 2,000 years who have participated in this meal and who are doing so today. Following Jesus' command to do this in remembrance of him, the Apostle Paul was not of the disciples who participated in that first supper, but Paul was faithful to lead his followers in celebrating it. It is he who used these words of institution as he led communion for that church, first church in Corinth. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup, a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So let's remember a few key teachings. First of all, Jesus said, Do this in remembrance of me. Remember, Jesus willingly carried out God's will, and he did drink the cup of redemption, the cup of wrath. He prayed that God might find another way. That's what he was trying to do in the Garden of Gethsemane. But when he, that didn't happen, he carried out God's will. Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. We are all part of that new covenant. The promise of forgiveness and life is is for all who believe. We are saved. Third, Jesus teaches that whenever we do this, that is, eat and drink the juice, we proclaim, we tell ourselves and others watching that we declare the gospel to be true. And note, and note, the bread and the juice are real reminders that Jesus really died on the cross, his body broken and his blood shed, that he did this for our salvation. These real elements of bread and juice are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let's pray before we take Lord Jesus, bless us with your presence through the Holy Spirit, that as we share this meal together, that we may really remember and believe in what you have done. And so we are reassured of our salvation because of what you have done for us on that cross, on that first Good Friday. Encourage us, we pray, as we eat and drink. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The bread that we break is the communion of the body of Christ. We 
Now remove the va wa vapor from your little cup and hold it in your hand. Take, eat, remember and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. The third cup, with all its rich meaning. The third, I will, I will redeem you, God says in Exodus. Jesus redeemed us. But for Jesus, it was a cup of God's wrath because all the sin of God's world. He knew that he had to shed his blood on the cross. Jesus wants us to remember this now as a new communion in his name. In his name. Communion in his blood. The cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks is a communion of the body of Christ. Take, drink. Remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Just a few words of praise and thanksgiving from Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our own iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you accomplished your mission, taking on humanity's toughest assignment. Your anguished prayers in the garden made it clear. You willingly followed through and submitted to the Father's will that we might be redeemed. Thank you. You stretched up your arms on the cross and met the price for sin, which is death. You gave your life so that we might have life in your name. You drank the cup of wrath for us. And now we are free and have hope and life in you. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you for putting into place this meal with its physical elements that remind us of what you did for us that first Good Friday. The cup is now for us a new covenant with you. Holy Spirit, dwell within us and help us live our lives of humble service. Help us to live out lives of humble service as followers of Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join in song. Let's stand in Christ alone. Oh, 
solid ground Flow through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, for by the ones He came to save, fill all that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. could not keep him there. On the third day, he arose that first Easter Sunday. Consider what it took Jesus to carry out the will of the Father, his agonizing prayer. Yet, he did it for you and for me. In gratitude, then, go with this blessing. The Lord keep you and bless you. The Lord make his face to smile on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. The old rugged cross.
Sunday where we can celebrate the freedom and excitement of our risen Savior.